come in handy for some of those long services, won't it? <laughs> Thank God. All right. You may be seated. Praise God. And now, uh, in the morning, we will be doing uh, on the millennium and on into eternity. Uh, generally, most of the time, I do it differently, but uh, in... Uh, uh, such uh, sessions as this, I uh, have a condensed uh, outline that I can follow and include the uh, millennium in this, but we'll save it for tomorrow, and doing it that way, we do a little bit uh, fuller outline of the situation. And uh, we believe the Lord is always on time, don't we? That's one thing we've learned. Never early, never late, but always right on time. We have uh, studied the first night on the uh, ancient winds of God. I'll think of it in a minute. <clears throat> and uh, the identifications of the nations, Daniel 7 is what? <clears throat> no. Daniel 7 is something else. That's Daniel 8. What comes before that? It's 2 is identification. 7 is Nature. natures. And as was said, 8 is the military prowess. Roman kingdom, of course, the legs of iron. And uh, we believe that we are in the feet of iron and clay now and that there probably are ten toes. We know there will be ten kingdoms. We'll find that out tonight. But you see, I built the foundation of that and I showed you prophecy through time. Then uh, I will uh, review. I think that uh, maybe if you'll flip that on for me, Brother NZ, I appreciate it. And uh, this uh, seems to be a little bit washed out, this particular slide. That's the Suntelia slide that we've had time after time. I think that this is one of the most helpful things in understanding prophecy is this graph. Uh, because you, you see uh, where the 70 weeks started. You see where Christ came you see that there is a gap, and we are now in that gap period where time is not measured upon the Jew. And uh, in that period of time, he has taken out a people for his name's sake. We uh, were on last night, the beginning of the 70th week, which is normally called the period of tribulation. I told you last night that I do not believe that, and I do not like that as the um, best term, and I explain to you why. Now somebody said, didn't Jesus say there shall be great tribulation like as was never before? I will say it like this, I believe that tribulation started with his prediction of the overthrow of Jerusalem. He said, these are the beginning of birth pangs. Now, what I believe that is saying, and, and uh, some commentaries and scholarship are, are at uh, odds as to what that means. They say only the, only the pain that is associated with birth uh, and, and not the beginning of something. Well, I beg their humble pardon. I believe that when it says these are birth pangs, Jesus said these are the beginning of birth pangs, sorrows. I believe that he was having reference to there being a birth for something. I don't think that he ever looked at the end as being conclusive within itself. He always breaks his own record. You know that? The Lord never goes from something good to something less. Right. Never has. He always goes from something good to something better. <coughs> Praise God. Uh, a lot of the church world would relegate us to a, a feelingless, non-inspirational, non-miraculous era. 
which would make it a less error, I don't care what you're saying, than what has preceded us. I don't believe that. I believe we go from grace to, to grace and from uh, one good thing to a better thing. And uh, <clears throat> so I believe that tribulation actually started with uh, Titus' overthrow of Jerusalem. You can't tell me when they skin a man alive and pour salt on him that that's not tribulation. I, I'd call that pressure, wouldn't you? That's what the word means. When you fry him alive on a huge grill, I'd say that's pressure. There's nothing that can be done to a man that hasn't been done to a man already. Women who were heavy with child, beaten upon the abdomen with boards with uh, huge nails in them, uh, water wheels, pulling out their tongues with hot pinchers, on and on and on. That's what man can do you. That's pressure. I said that like a Frenchman. That's what man can do you. But, uh, but what we're talking about, that last period of time, is not pressure. Not what man can do, but from the beginning. It's the stars falling. It is uh, cataclysmic changes in the earth. And man doesn't do that. That's God. And it's the wrath of God. I would like for you that are uh, theology students as well as everyone else to remember that the rest of your life. I'd like for you to consider my, my proposition that I, am, uh, that I offer to you. That, um, that that's the wrath of God. And uh, that it is not tribulation as just per the word. I believe there has been tribulation like the world has never seen. And it continued upon the Jews and will continue upon them. But what happens in this book of Revelation is there's a wrath of God. And I showed you when it started. Uh, if you remember that and make that distinction, you might want to learn the Greek words so that you can uh, tell everybody about it. And that is uh, pressure... The word tribulation is thlipsis, T-H-I-L-I-P-S-I-S, thlipsis, that's pressure. And the word for wrath is orgaze, from which you get the word orgy, orgaze, which is just unleashed passion, and this is the unleashed passion of God. <clears throat> now then. So we're in the gap period. Somebody said, how will the 70 weeks start? How will it start? I'll cover that tonight, but I'll mention it now. I believe the rapture happens sometimes before it starts. That may not be the thing that triggers it, but I believe that it will be in the proximity. It starts, Daniel 9 and 27, with a covenant made with the prince that shall come. It shall start with a covenant between the prince and with Israel. So Daniel 9 and 27 says. All right. So that is what we studied on God's use of time. And uh, now we are in the 70th week. And you see a little division in the middle. We'll, we stopped at the dividing of that week. We will be on the last three and a half years of it tonight. We gave you uh, the two witnesses. Which... Uh, we believe are Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. I discount Enoch because Enoch uh, really had no great uh, effect upon Israel as per any type of dispensation and any type of movement, uh, Moses and Elijah. Now, it is described, another reason I didn't cover last night, the reason I know it's Moses and Elijah, or I think it is, Sometimes we need to be careful about what we say we, we believe. Sometimes we only think it. We don't really believe it. We just think it. And that's good enough. Uh, you're not going to do yourself any harm by being careful. But Revelations tells you what happened to them, identifies them in the days of their prophecy. What did it say about them? One of them that he had power to shut up heaven that it rained not during the days of his prophecy. Well, that's Elijah. 
Now, that's what you call the hermeneutic approach. Is that a good word? I'm not talking bad. That's a good word, hermeneutic approach. It means allowing the Bible to explain itself. And, uh, and I, I, I like to think that, that I, am, I am such a, a detailed person. I like to make sure of something so well that you can imagine uh, the quality of the hermeneutic approach would be to me. Then the next one, it says that, um, that uh, he had the power to smite the earth with plagues as often as he will in the days of his prophecy. So that would be Moses, of course. And then those two appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. So now they're going to turn the hearts of the people back to God. That's what God is wanting in the 19th chapter of the uh, book of Deuteronomy. It said in the last days that, uh, and these are the last days. He tells us what will happen in the last days when you are in tribulation, that uh, you are going to turn to me and I am going to remember my covenants. So I think that that may be uh, something for us to appreciate. Uh, maybe it's 4 and 19. Maybe I've got it backwards anyway. It is there. I can find it for you later. All right. Uh, now, I am going to the middle of the book of Revelation. We are going to the 12th chapter. And in the 12th chapter, we are smack dab in the middle. That's good English, isn't it? In the middle of the book of Revelation. Uh, when you are in the uh, 11th and 12th and 13th book, you are in the middle of the book of Revelation and you're in the middle of the week. The Daniel 70th week, you have come to the middle of it. Just look, if you will, at uh, 11 and 2. And uh, the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles. Uh, I want you to notice that, please. Uh, Brother Enzi, uh, we're hearing from a particular area that the times of the Gentiles is over. I would like to point, and it was in our Herald, uh, pardon me, I shouldn't have said that, it was in one of our publications not long ago, that the Gentile, uh, times the Gentiles was over. Turn to this 11th chapter and you'll read where that, don't measure the outer court of that temple because it is given unto the Gentiles. For the holy city shall be trodden down until for 42 more months. So for the last 42 months of of so-called tribulation, uh, Gentiles are still treading in that holy place. How can the times of the Gentiles be over with? You see what I mean? Everybody sees what I mean. Nod your head and shake a bush. All right. You may not hear that. You may not have heard that, but you will hear it. Read the third verse. It tells you, I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three, that is three and a half years. If you'll look at, um, if you'll look at 12 and 6, you'll see again that there's a thousand two hundred and three score days. If you'll look in the 14th verse of the 12th chapter, you'll see a time and times and a half a time which is three and a half years. If you look in the 13th chapter and the fifth verse, you'll see that uh, power was given unto the Antichrist that he was to continue. Notice he is to continue. For all those who believe the Antichrist is not revealed unto the last 42 months, I beg your humble pudding, power is given to him to continue. 42 months. For all you mid-tribulation rapturists, he is already, has already been going. He has already been going. He is going to continue 42 months, which is that three and a half years. So you can see in the 11th, 12th, 13th chapter, we are in the middle of the book. Now, I have called the 12th chapter the panorama of God and Israel. It is an overall view of the Jews and their relationship to God. And I want us to use the hermeneutic approach. Everybody say hermeneutic. hermeneutic. Name one of your kids that. 
he go around and everybody call him Herman Nudick. They think the uh, Ick is the middle name. Uh, I, I want it to be applied right here in this chapter. Because we see the woman and the serpent again. Here's the woman and the serpent again, just like you had to start with. But all common uh, terrors and everybody I've read after all agree that the woman is Israel in general. That is Israel in general because she is described uh, as having the uh, 12 stars as a crown and so forth and the moon and so on her feet described in the Old Testament so that she is identified in the New. I will cover that now. These are the personage and the serpent we know. All right? We have, we let the Bible explain itself. We say the woman is Israel. Everybody agrees. Everybody knows who the serpent is. Everybody knows who the dragon is, the red dragon. I'll show you his picture in a minute. He's handsome. But when we get down to the man child, we go wild. And everybody starts imagining it. Well, if you don't agree with me tonight, just be humble and let me talk since I have the floor. And uh, then you can tell your later, which is all right with me. We call the man child, some of them say it's the church. The church is not a product of Israel. Our mother is Jerusalem, which is from above, the Bible said. We're not a product of Israel. And there is an effort, a double effort at identification on this particular personage in the 12th chapter of Revelation so that you would not misunderstand. It is not man-child, as is in the authorized version. That would be anthropos technon. The word is arsenhuion, which means a male son. Singular male son, which is a double effort at identification. And this is her son that Israel brought forth who was caught up to God and broke the nations with a rod of iron. That's none other than Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. And then there's some people believe that the remnant is the man-child. The difference is it is careful to make the remnant neuter plural. It is tan lopan spermatos, or the remaining ones of her seed. That's the remnant. The first important one that Israel produced that uh, caught, was caught up to God and the throne and broke the nations was the man Jesus Christ. Now the next one that she is going to produce, Israel in general is going to produce, is the remaining ones of her seed. It is plural and neuter. All right. Now I say the woman is Israel with the stars as a crown and the moon under her feet identified in the Old Testament. This woman is Israel in general. Talking about entire general uh, area here. All right, she brings, and here, of course, is the devil. He's red, isn't he? He's not white. What color is the horse in Revelation? Red. That's right. War with the, uh, I believe that's the rise of the Antichrist is the red horse. I told you that last night, and I covered it. Seven heads. You are not left to your imagination what those seven heads are. You see, what I like about this is you're not left to your imagination. It tells you, it identifies who the son is by what happened to him. It tells you who the devil is uh, and who this dragon is in the 17th and 18th chapter, which I'll cover. 
draws one third of the stars of heaven with him. We believe that it is, of course, angels. That, uh, that may be open to discussion. But uh, the personages of Revelation. Now, the woman brings forth the man child, and the devil is just waiting to get him, as I preach to you here today. Tried to destroy him totally. And when he thought he had him, he was caught up to God and his throne and broke the nations with a rod of iron. Now this makes the devil as hot as he can be. He turns back and he sends out a shaktuth. He sends out a flood after the woman. To, he turns on her then after he wasn't able successfully to kill that seed. Turns on that woman. And yet the earth helps her. And swallows her up. And we showed you that in, uh, that in uh, Daniel, it said that uh, uh, Edom and Moab was keep out of the hand. But uh, she is going to flee into Edom and Moab. And here it says, into the wilderness. Flies into the wilderness where she is nourished for three and a half years. The last years. This is Israel in general. The woman of uh, the Jews in general flees there. I showed you the rock city of Petra. You remember that the first night? And uh, all, all uh, commentators now believe that Petra will be used in the uh, preservation of Israel in general. It is formidable. When the Romans tried to take it away from the Nabataeans, uh, uh, around the time of Christ they could not do it because there is a canyon about as wide as uh, well more narrow than these pews for over a mile long sheer canyon walls on either side and the uh, it was very easily defended. However, there is an aqueduct or was an aqueduct that ran along the wall of that canyon, which was the water source that came from Moses Spring, where the rock still, water still runs from that rock and flowed down through that aqueduct, down the canyon walls, down into Petra. The only way that the Romans could do was to break that aqueduct and to uh, literally starve them out because Petra is surrounded with, with uh, sheer canyon walls. But I believe it is there where God will take the woman. See, she's fleeing into the wilderness. The man-child has been caught up. Somebody said, yeah, but you mean that's so quick? Yeah, this is a panoramic view. It's an overall view, and God is not particular about thousands of years. It's like one day to him. Is that what the Bible said? All right. So the woman in general, but now it makes him mad, and he turns after the woman, and she flees into the wilderness, and the Lord hides her for three and a half years. That makes him mad. So he turns on the tan lopan spermatus. He turns on the remaining ones of her seed. And for some reason, the remnant, which I believe is the 144,000, uh, does not escape. They do not escape. And I will explain it to you uh, right now. I think I have it in sequence here. I've got the 144,000 in sequence. You've got them in the seventh chapter. They were sealed. And the word is fragizo. It means they are marked. It doesn't mean they're preserved like in a jar of pickles. It means that they are marked. The seventh chapter, the Lord picks out and marks those that will be that remnant of the end time. So they are marked. And I am sorry my young people left out one particular verse. There should be five things here. That's why that, that wasn't in there today. And uh, they, that was a defective slide. I'm sorry I got the wrong one up there. But number two is in the 11th chapter, as I showed you when the two witnesses are caught up to God, the remnant falls on their face. And they are converted and give glory to God. I know that's where they're converted because the next time I see them, uh, they're standing on Mount Zion. 
All right. I believe that they are overcome by the beast in the 13th chapter. It says there, and this throws a lot of people off, they read where that the Antichrist or the beast is given power to overcome the saints. And, and every time some people see the word saints, they think of church. And as I said today in, in uh, uh, answering questions, uh, the book of Revelations is a new bottle for new wine. It has many, many allusions to the Old Testament and to the articles of the tabernacle and to the Old Testament worship, but at the same time, including some of the New Testament and joins both of them together. Saints is used in the Old Testament as well. You have to determine who those people are. They are not ecclesia, uh, which is the church, but they are... Uh, just simply saints like are used in the Old Testament and the word saints applies to the particular area that God is dealing with at the time uh, and so on uh, you might change those figures now if you will look at it as much as this is a defective slide and it just hit me behind the head when I saw it uh, number one they are sealed in the seventh chapter number two they are converted in the eleventh chapter by the two witnesses that's what God is really after. Why doesn't he end it all and just take us home to glory? It's because he has promised the Jews seven different covenants that's got to be kept here. So he's got to convert them. So they're converted in the 11th chapter. Number three, they are overcome by the beast in the 13th chapter. How do I know they are the ones that are killed? Because the last time I saw them, they were kneeling and were giving glory to God. All right, now I see them in the 14th chapter standing on Mount Zion and they are before the throne of God. Last time I saw them, they were in Jerusalem on the knees. Now they're in glory before the throne. So I know they are the Haggai which have been overcome by the beast. Then in the fourth chapter, uh, pardon me, number five it is. What am I saying? I'm really goofing. They are given thrones to reign for 1,000 years. That's 24 through 6. All right. I think that should help you, that little sequence there of the 144,000. So if you, if you will, please, the remnant, I believe, is the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel. That is not the woman in general. That is, that is the remnant, the remaining ones of her seed. Praise the Lord. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, we'll go a little farther. Now we come to the beast and battles. And I want to go to the 13th chapter. And I want to read to you some scripture if I may hear. The first verse, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of the lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his uh, seat, and great authority. Let me woe you there. Uh, that, that, this description makes you think of that old, that old uh, vision of Daniel, doesn't it? It makes you think of the vision of Daniel. What this last kingdom is, what this last beast is, is a further carrying on of all of the Gentile powers. You see what I mean? The middle man, the seventh chapter of the, uh, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible beast, and finally the eighth chapter of the ram, the he goat, and, and the little horn. Uh, these are all Gentile powers having sway over Israel. Now, when we go to describe the final beast of the end time, I know those Gentile powers have not ceased because this one includes all of the other attributes of the Gentile powers preceding him, but then adds this New Testament connotation and says that it has the, and the dragon, which is just uh, very new in the 12th chapter, that is New Testament. So we have joined the two together. You see, once again, we've joined the two together. And uh, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded and so on. And I wondered, 
power was given to him to continue 42 months in the fifth chapter, given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And uh, uh, it begins to describe him just a little more. So I am studying about the beast in battles. Now the first one that I, I see is a beast that is out of the land or out of the sea. He has seven heads. You are told in the 17th and 18th chapter that those are seven mountains upon which this uh, harlot woman sits, representing, of course, the, uh, the Romish church. We know that Rome sits on seven hills. It's a city that sits on seven hills. The reason I, I, uh, I don't like the Shinar adventure so much uh, as I mentioned today, is because Rome is so well known as the city of seven hills. The ten horns, we're told, are, are ten nations which rule for one hour or for just a little time. We don't have a parabolic interpretation. that We, we have a literal interpretation here. You have one head that has been wounded. Some say that's Robert Kennedy that's going to be revived and whatever. Or John F. Kennedy. I, I don't believe that, that they were one of the heads. I believe the heads have been political powers and, and ecclesiastical powers. I believe that Rome has been wounded. That's simply all we're saying. Rome has been hurt. She's not the power she once was. She ruled the seas, my friend, and was absolute power so that, that her emperor was called God. And they worshipped him as being divine. Even in the time of the apostles, they saw this. Well, now they're wounded. They don't have the absolute power they used to have, and yet they still are there. If you had been with me uh, in uh, Brazil some years ago, uh, you would have seen on, on a certain day they were bringing a, and of course there are 90% Catholics there. They were bringing a statue through called Our Lady of Fatima. And... Uh, and I never saw anything like it. A ticker tape parade and the streets are crowded. You couldn't move when you got out there. The bridges, the overpasses were filled with people. They were throwing confetti out of the window. And all it was, a little statue about so high that they're going to take it into their, to the um, uh, temple there, into the church. And they're going to set it up for a few minutes. And then they're going to take it on up through Peru and let everybody else worship that statue that is supposed to cry some real tears at one time or another. They always got some spooky miracle that never does anybody any good. I'm leery of miracles that don't do any good. Amen? Amen. Well, that let me know how much power Rome has. And she is wounded, but she is building again. Did you know that now I understand that uh, there is going to be a, a, a Vatican representative in uh, most of the uh, renowned conferences, perhaps even the United Nations. I do know that Rome is represented at the common market countries with veto power. All right. So that's the beast out of the land. It is simply Rome. And Rome at that point will be ten nations. And I will uh, show you, uh, well, here it is coming up out of the sea. Seven heads and ten horns and crowns. Those are diademas, crowns of royalty. All right. Now I have named here the common market countries. Not ten here, but... Uh, uh, now, these may change. There will be a change, I'm sure. I understand that Greece is to be dropped and Italy, or pardon me, that uh, uh, Spain is to join. And anyway, at this particular time, we are, uh, I'm sorry, Ireland, I believe it is. I forget which one. Ireland, Britain, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, West Germany, Luxembourg, France, and Italy. Uh, you have, you now have ten already. Ten are there now. That prophecy is fulfilled. 
Never before has that been like that. Never before have we had that. Out in front of the common market country tonight, ten flags are waving. Representing those ten nations. Did you know that there's one flagpole that does not have one on it? And that is their representative and their ambassador or president or whatever you want to call it. I hate to be here when he gets a flag. Amen? Amen. So when we talk about the beast out of the sea, we're talking about a ten federation of nations. Where does the United States fit? Here we have our president bending over with trouble, bowing in the Oval Office, just burdened down with trouble. In the last election, the question was raised among all politicians. Has the presidency of the United States become too great for one man to handle? Should not it be a duality or a plurality? as two presidents because it has become so great a burden. It is just almost impossible for that man to be everything that he needs to be. So we're looking for a champion. Somebody said, where do you think the United States will fit? I believe that the Roman Empire is not so much geographical boundaries as it is a spiritual entity. And Paul said that spirit already begins to work. I personally believe that those countries that are heavily Romish dominated will be aligned with this bestial system of the end time. And you and I are very definitely Roman dominated. That's the truth, not only just by the number of Catholics that are here, but so tied in politically, our president has to call uh, the Pope when he goes to sneeze. Now, they don't, they don't quote you and I, but they quote him on every world event. I believe that what you have on the side of the beast is what really is known as the free world. I believe that you could pretty well call it the free world. Now, although there will be, and there are ten final absolute nations, I really don't think that we are that important. Our history is only 200 years. That's not very old when you get to considering some of these other nations that lived a long time. Rome uh, existed for uh, hundreds of years and still going. We, we are actually just a young upstart. I believe God has used the United States for two reasons. He has used it to incubate the New Testament church of the end time and to nourish that church and spread the gospel. I believe he has used it to put Israel back in Palestine and to bring his word about in that particular area. Our usefulness may be very limited from here on. We may be going downhill just a good deal. Used to, we were a respected nation everywhere we went. But now we're the ugly American. It's no great thing for some little third-rate nation to burn our flag. And for some little upstart like Iran to get our hostages or our, our diplomats and hold them as long as they get ready. Do you know the one I understand, and I heard this too as well on the radio, the one that finally jarred them loose and told them that you had best release them? It was the common market. More and more, it is getting out of the economic realm into the political realm. More and more, it's getting that way. It, I remember before they released, I remember listening, and I told my wife, I said, listen, the common market issued their demand that Iran release the hostages. And uh, later on the comment was made that it was their stress that placed it because uh, they were aware of the coffers still supplying this country. These nations have a lot of economic clout. Their, their gross product is greater than all of ours. Their, their, their combined wealth is greater than ours. We're needing our allies like we've never needed them before.
We've got to have them. The first thing Carter did when he became president was go to the European common market and seek closer cooperation. We are a member of 16 world organizations right now with them. And, uh, and uh, a treaty is going to be made between this bestial system and Israel of the last time. So I believe America is important only as we relate to supply these uh, ten nations that form that federation of the end time. Now, I read of a beast that comes up out of the sea in the 11th chapter, or the 11th verse. It says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, as I read tonight, I want you to watch my, the, the emphasis that I give, all right? He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He doeth wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had uh, power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had the wound and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak cause that as many was not worship the image of the beast that it should be killed and he causeth all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead so that no man might bind or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man his number is six hundred three score and six all right did you get the way i was emphasizing the reading i emphasize the first beast everything that he does here is for the first beast he is a representative of the first beast he does signs and wonders for the first beast. He makes an image of the first beast. That first beast is the real power. And, and, and I, I, I use that uh, quote in, in uh, sense. This, only, this representative only is powerful as he is able to give power unto this beast. And whatever he can do as an ambassador. Now. Uh, it, uh, somebody said, do you believe it will be a man? It is the number of a man. But the way he is described in the Bible, something about him is different and something is supernatural. All right. Now, I, I want to talk about the mark that he has given in just a little bit. Well, I'll do it now. I'll tell you what, a student of Polycarp, who was a student of John said about 666. Did you get what I said? Irenaeus, who was a student of Polycarp, who was a student of John, said that 666 is the numerical equivalent of the Greek word Latinos, which means Latin kingdom. And that's exactly what we're saying, that it is Rome, for that is the Latin kingdom. Latin is the official language and was the official language of Rome. All right? So Latin kingdom, and that Latin kingdom spreads throughout Europe and all through the Americas. Not Arabic, not Semitic, not, uh, not any of the other... Uh, connected ones, uh, but it is, it is Latin kingdom. Now, I believe that that is true. I believe 666 is the number of Latin kingdom. I accept that in as much as is a grand student of John. Now, it is the number of a man. It says, and six is the number of a man. He was made on the sixth day. And I don't care how many times he multiplies that, man will never be seven. He'll always be just six. He'll never be perfect. Never be perfect. Not in this world he won't be. I don't believe man can make himself perfect. But it is the number of a man. And that number is 666. Now, it will be in your 
hand and in your forehead and you will not be able to bind or sell unless you have that mark. Now it says all oh, poor and free and uh, poor and rich all receive that mark. You might get that with, with a, a uh, qualification that Russia and Gog and Magog are not going to take it. That's what they're going to fight against. But you and I, who will be dominated by it, would have to take that mark to buy and sell. Uh, now here is a woman sliding her hand into a computer which reads a invisible number on her hand. It already is in process. And in a peck of a second, it can be relayed to whatever checkpoint needs to be. If you're in a grocery store, sack full of groceries, you, uh, you uh, go up to the checkout stand, they tell you you don't have enough money in your, in your particular account and you have to go take some of it back. And you've been hearing about computers. Somebody said, do you believe that computer in Belgium is the beast? No, I believe that the beast is going to be a supernatural individual. He says, well, he has life. Give power to the image of the beast. That's the image of the beast. This man has power that this image he is making. He can make it have life and move. He has supernatural power. I don't believe computerization or that computer is the beast. I believe he will have large eyes. I believe he will have a mouth like a man. And I believe that he has power to do miracles in the sight of man. Now, I'll tell you what, that may not mean much to you, but uh, if somebody were running here and I say, hey, did you know there's a guy outside that's pulling fire down from heaven? I wonder how many would jump run out there. We better not have our mind on miracles so much. Only those which are backed up by the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. But uh, you either have that uh, mark or else. Somebody say, well, I just won't take the mark of the beast and I'll be saved. Find that in the Bible where you're saved by something you don't do. All I find out is if you don't take it, you're killed. That don't mean you're saved. It just means you just kind of cut it all short. Here is a guillotine in front of a church. It may be that when the true church of the living God is gone that our churches will be used for just such purposes as this. No, I don't believe we're part of this. The wrath of God is going to fall upon people who live in that particular period. Uh, then, now I'll tell you what is difficult in prophecy to do. It's follow everything through at the same time. That's what's confusing. You want to follow the Jews all the way through. At the same time, you try to follow the uh, Gentiles all the way through. You try to follow the Antichrist all the way through. And it's difficult. So it's good for me to go back and just pick up, let's see the activities of the beast, if you will. The beast in the 70th week. All right. He makes a covenant for one week. And this is the first three and a half years. Daniel 9 and 27. He battles the king of the north and south, which is Russia and Egypt. Daniel 11 and 40 and Ezekiel 38. He defeats them, the same scriptures. This is what he is doing in the first three and a half years. After the first three and a half years, he enters Jerusalem, Daniel 11 and 41. He sets up his palace in the glorious mountain, Daniel 11 and 45. He demands worship, Revelations 13 and 15. He overcomes the two witnesses and the remnant. And the last thing he does is battle with the armies of the east. Daniel 11 and 44 in Revelations 15 and 12. Now, somebody said, why do we have in the book of Revelations not seven years mentioned, but only 42 months or three and a half years or 1,260 days? Because I told you, the Lord says that I'm going to cut out time upon thy people and the holy city. Up to this point, the Antichrist has not been in the holy city. He has made a covenant and has with the Jewish people, 
But the complete thing has not been done because it must be upon the city as well. And, and when he whips these countries, which I shall describe in a moment, that come against him, then he enters into Jerusalem and you start counting then the last half of that week upon him because now he not only has power over the people, but he is in the city itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. He is in the city itself. And uh, another thing is, what are you going to do with the first half of Revelations? You don't talk about 42 months until you get in the middle of the week, in the middle of the book. What about the first half? What about the scripture that says he is going to continue for 42 months? That tells me that he has been going before that. All that has happened is that he has made a covenant. He has protected Israel. He has defeated her enemies. And now he marches into Jerusalem. And when both of those parts of those, that covenant is, is upon him, then you measure 42 months and that's in the middle of the week. I think that should be very clear to you. And if anybody asks you why you only find three and a half years, it is not because that's all tribulation is going to be. I find where he continues, he's already been introduced. He's already been fighting for the first half of it. It's just now he says, okay, boys, I whipped them for you. Now I want you to get down and worship me. And he marches into Jerusalem and sets up his temple in the glorious mountain. Let us identify the nations that are with him in uh, uh, Ezekiel 38. Let's identify them. Rosh is Russia. In the Septuagint, I explained to you, the Septuagint is a Greek uh, a translation of the Old Testament 200 years before Christ. It is the Bible that Paul used mostly, Greek translation. And it does not say Gog there, it says Rosh, which is Russia. Now I'm going to give you some uh, authorities. Don't read the rest of it. Just listen to me for a moment. I'm going to give you some authorities for this fact. All right. Magog was the second son of Japheth. Did you know that? Magog was the second son of Japheth, Genesis 10 and 1, 2. One of the three sons of Noah. Before the dawn of secular history, his descendants seem to have inhabited exclusively the region of the Caucasus and of northern Armenia. It is interesting to note that the word Caucasus, which there are Caucasus mountains that divide Russia uh, from Afghanistan and so on, that means Gog's fort. All right? I could go on and say the Turanian race comprised those Asiatic Magogites or Scythians who dwelt upon the great plateau of Central Asia. Today their descendants are known as Tartars, Cossacks, Finns, Kalmyks, Mongols. If modern lexicographers are consulted as to what nation now represents Rosh, nearly all of them together will say Russia. Jesenius, whose Hebrew lexicon has never been superseded, said that Gog is undoubtedly the Russians. He declares that Russia was a designation of the tribes then north of the Taurus mountains dwelling in the neighborhood of the Volga and so on so I, I have a long list of, of uh, qualifications uh, scholarly wise uh, from commentaries as to who Rush is Russia Rush is Russia of course and I just explained it to you Egypt still retains her same name in Ezekiel 38 these countries are going to come against Israel in battle Never before have they been lined up like they are now. This scripture has never been fulfilled like it is today. They're lined with the Warsaw Pact right now. Russia, Egypt, and Persia. Now Persia, ancient Persia, covered an area that reached east to the Ganges Mountains in India, uh, the Ganges River, all the way south to the Persian Gulf all the way north to the Caucasus Mountains involve the countries that are known as Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And uh, it is this area. So Persia is actually Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And notice whether or not they want to willingly, just like Afghanistan, they're going to go with Russia, whether they want to or not. You know why? Because the Bible said they would. 
I, I was uh, interviewed on Harvest Time broadcast, I don't know whether any of you heard it or remember it, about the time of the Afghanistan invasion. And uh, Brother Rose asked me the importance of it, and I, I explained to him that Afghanistan is a portion of ancient Persia, and whether witting or unwittingly, uh, they are going to align and be part of this uh, battle of Gog and Magog. All right. Ethiopia, for the bigger part of the times that is used in Scripture, does not refer, refer to a portion of Africa, but refers to Saudi Arabia. And Libya still has the same name. She's already an ally of Russia. All right, Gomer is Germany, divided by the Rhine. Isn't that strange? Togomar is Turkey. And Turkey was in our ballpark until here recently. And she went over to the side of the Russians. So what you have right now... These countries, whether they want to or not, are lining up. I have an article of Reader's Digest of Anwar Sadat before he died. They question him about his projection of the future of the Middle East. And he said it is inevitable that all of the Arab nations will go with Russia. Whether willingly or unwillingly. He pointed to what just happened in Afghanistan. He said another reason is, is because America is so passive. They are not aggressive enough. Also the proximity of Russia to these countries in America is thousands of miles away. They, it is a joke now in Congress about our rapid deployment force. How long it would take us to deploy a force to the Middle East. Of course, we got some Marines there, but I want you to look how long it takes to get them there, too. But Russia is just, just a little few moments away from any of these countries. So they are lying like that. I tell you what, Russia has never been important in the Bible before. And it's never been important in history before. Now is the only time that she can stand up and raise up her head so that to qualify herself as the Gog of the Bible. Do you see that? Say amen. amen. All right. So this is Gog and Magog. That is not the battle that is mentioned in the last part of the book of Revelation. And I'll explain why. Because in this battle... There is one-sixth left of them. There's one-sixth left of them. But in the final battle of Gog and Magog, which has reference there to a particular area that has gone against God, it is a complete renovation of the earth and all of them. That is after the millennium. That is a different one. This battle, there is a sixth part of them left. Now, the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 that the king of the north has an evil thought come into his mind. And he says, now let us go down to the land of unwalled villages and they're unwalled. Let us take a prey of them that are dwelling safely. Well, now why are they safe not having walls? Because of the covenant that has been made with their champion. And I believe that covenant is being made with the common market nations right now. I believe that you and I are playing footsie and very close. We're involved in that treaty for only this past week. Did they decide to use the American dollar in Israel instead of the shekel? Because the stores were not honoring their shekel. Their economy was so bad that they started honoring only the American dollar. And, and their Knesset reasoned if, uh, if that's the way they look at it, we might as well go along with it. I don't know what the final outcome of that will be. But uh, everything is lining up. I'm glad I have the truth of God in my soul, aren't you? I'm so glad I have the Holy Ghost and that we are able to see these things coming to pass uh, upon the earth right now. 
Everything is heading toward that valley of Armageddon. You can see Galilee up there and Jordan and the Dead Sea right there by it. All attention is being focused. We are not training our soldiers for, for jungle warfare like we were in Vietnam now. They're training for desert warfare. This is what's going on now. We are moving them in more and more and more. We are being sucked into the vortex of that war in the Middle East right when we got through with Vietnam and everybody declared up and down and sideways we'd never get caught in a, in a situation like that again but here we are here is our other nations and strangely the peacekeeping nations mainly are coming from the European common market Israel has just backed up a little bit and said alright we'll let y'all go ahead with the multinational forces and we are setting up and we're taking their bullets and are dying right now in the Middle East. Oh brother, it ought to cause us to realize our boys are dying right now in the Middle East. Could it be we have already heard the first shots of Gog and Magog? I have said this, I do not believe the church will go through what is normally called tribulation. But if the church does not go through it, the Lord is going to have to come for that church real soon. Because these things are shaping up so swiftly and the battle is already, they can't get out of it. They stop one little brush fire here down in Suez and they start another one. It's their boundaries that's bothering them. The Suez and toward the Euphrates. They're going to rule all of that country. And as I told you the other night, Assad who is um, uh, is the man in Syria said the Jews are not interested in the Golan Heights and in the West Bank they are interested in ruling from the Nile to the Euphrates and a chill went up and down my spine as I realized the last fight they had in the last war they were lobbing shells into Damascus amen and they were already crossing going toward uh, the Nile River Oh, glory. It, it, it makes chills go up and down my spine. Never has it been like this. We have never been like that before. Not in World War II, nor World War I, nor any other time have we ever been like that. Right now, multinational forces are taking the blows for the Jews. I'm preaching a prophecy conference tonight that I have never been in before. And that is, I am preaching at this moment, multinational forces from whom the bulk is from the countries I described to you have backed up and a champion is taking the blows for Israel. Glory. I'm hanging on to that because I want you to see the effect that's in your world right now. I tell you what, it ought to make the world know that our God is a great God and that he is still over all blessed forever. It ought to make them sit up and realize, they're going to realize it one of these days, that that bunch of Holy Ghost people down there were really the pivotal point of all of the modern day. I believe we are the ones that hold all of the other denominations in sway relative to holiness. I believe when this church is gone, they are going to sin and they're going to preach a gospel that will allow you to sin with all candor. I, I believe that, Brother Enzi. I believe we are at the force, at the very core of the morals of this world right now. I believe we are. Don't think they're ignorant of us. They know about us. They all know about us. Praise God. Oh, I'm ha don't be ashamed to tell them, no, we don't, we don't go to the picture show. No, we don't dance. Amen. Don't be ashamed to tell them what we, thank God, they need to know there. That's the only, that is the only feeling of moral that's holding them right now. I believe they would have already gone except our preacher is just dumb enough to get up and poke it down their throat and say, you bunch of double-barreled hypocrites, this is the way that you got to be. God is holy. Amen. I'd, I'd like for you to rest. I'd like for you to stand for just a moment. I think you ought to be grateful that God has shown us and God has opened our eyes to the truth of God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. I've never, and you've never lived in a world like we're in right now. Never, 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 never have we lived in a world like we're in right now. Sin is everywhere. The devil is everywhere. Now, long ago, quartet, our Conqueror's Quartet was together. We was in a, in a restaurant. And uh, it was a busy restaurant, something like a Denny's or whatever. And we were paying our bill and people were crowding around. And all of a sudden, there was a man that passed by us and looked at Sister Caruth. And with evil, horrible eyes, looked at her and said, let me alone. And just kept walking. We can just touch the devil and make him mad anywhere we go right now. Amen. Our presence just makes him mad. That's all there is to it. Let me alone. No, we're not going to let you alone. Hallelujah to God. We are a moral conscience to this world. Amen. We are the last frontier and bastion of holiness and godlikeness. I declare without us, without us, homosexuality will be the order of the day. I say the Antichrist will be one and he will make it charming and acceptable to be one. He will make it the elite to be that. We are the moral conscience of the world today. Don't be ashamed that you've got a Holy Ghost. It's not just any kind of a spirit. Somebody said, why don't you say Holy Spirit like some of our... Preachers are doing now. They're switching to spirit. I'll tell you why. Spirit is ambiguous. That's non-identified. But when you say a ghost, that means it belonged to somebody. Amen. Amen. That identifies it. It's not just any kind of a spirit. It belonged to somebody. And this is not just any kind of a spirit. This is a holy ghost. Whoa, hallelujah. I am not a shame of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Glory to God, I am not ashamed. You may be seated. Everything is coming down to Armageddon. Man's hearts are failing him, looking out of his window, and this man sees a vision of nuclear holocaust in the world beginning to erupt. The Bible says men's hearts will fail them for fear of looking what is coming upon the earth fearful time that we're in right now you don't realize the peace of God that you've got in your heart right tonight there's one thing absolutely that I have and that is please like comment and subscribe